Good morning, Crossroad. How's everyone doing this morning? Good to see y'all, and good morning to everyone online. We are so glad you're here. Y'all go ahead and stand. We're going to make a joyful noise this morning. Ooh, and we're going to praise a mighty God who saves this morning, someone who is there with us when we need them and even when we realize we do not. And y'all, just by a show of hands and everyone at home in the comments, just type in how the Lord has shown up for you this week. And everyone here, has, any, has the Lord shown up for anyone this week? Let's go give him a round of applause real quick. We serve, again, a mighty, mighty God who saves. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures of faith. Are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Lift your voices, Crossroad. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you see them all, and you still call me praise. Praise God. Because the God of the mountain is the God.
love this next song because it really goes through all that God has done for us, which is pretty amazing to put in one song. <laughs> but I think that's why it's so powerful. Let's sing together. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without love, to from heaven you came running, there was mercy. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin through the world, from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dead. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the And maybe you've experienced that too and stopped in the middle of that just to take in a deep breath 
Um, and on the hottest of days, that can be the little respite, a little bit of relief in the middle of something so, so um, maybe miserable. Um, and the same thing can be of the, the breath of God that he fulfills in us. The spirit and his presence within us can be the rejuvenation of our souls and the respite that we need in that, in that moment. So as we um, sing and introduce this new song to you, use this as your moment of peace and as your moment of rest. Take it in. Breathe in the breath. Don't uh, don't sit down yet. Don't sit down yet. <laughs> Sorry. 
I know I missed that by about a second and a half. Uh, today is Pentecost Sunday, so we, uh, so Christians around the world, uh, we we take uh, take this day to celebrate, to remember God pouring out His Holy Spirit uh, on on the believers who were gathered just a few weeks after uh, Jesus um, had ascended uh, to heaven. And so Jesus left them. He told them all of this was going to happen. But kind of like you and I today, uh, God can, can tell us things over and over and over, and we still have a hard time sometimes connecting the dots. And that was very much the case for those first followers of Jesus. And so they were gathered in a room. They were trying to make sense of everything, trying to figure out what was supposed to happen next. And in the midst of them gathering to worship and pray, just like you and I are doing today, imperfect followers of Jesus gathering to worship, to pray, to seek some direction, to seek some hope. God poured out his Holy Spirit uh, on them, filled them with power, filled them with his presence. It was very mysterious. They, they couldn't make sense of everything yet. They didn't know what was going on. They just knew that it was really, really good <laughs> because God was there. And friends, God is here. God is here with us today. See, the gift of Pentecost is that it was not a one and done event. It was an ongoing promise of God's presence made available to you and me. If today is your first time coming to church in a long time, guess what? The promise is for you too. It's for you too. It's for all of us who, who are simply willing to just make that slight turn toward faith, toward hope, toward belief. Even if there's something stirring in you right now, you're still trying to connect the dots and figure it out. And there's just this thing within you that, that's just yearning to believe, trying to believe. Even there, God's grace is that good, that he'll meet us more than halfway. And so uh, this, this song that the, the band has taught us now, I, wanna, I want us to use this as just a Pentecost prayer. Um, can we do that together uh, for a moment? So the, there's that part you guys were singing. It said, uh, the, the fragrance of heaven, there's a, a fresh wind, pour your spirit out. Pour your... So can we do that? Let, let's sing this. Let's pray this together. Could you guys lead us? Yeah. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven, pour your spirit out. For your spirit out, a holy anointing, the power of your presence. For your spirit out, for your spirit out. We need a fresh wind. We need a fresh wind. The fragrance of heaven. For your spirit out.
Amen. Well, now you may be seated. No, I should just go home. I can't top that. I cannot top the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Well, listen, my name is Alex, and I am so glad you're here, as well as everyone else in this room. Welcome, welcome to you folks and to you online. We are so excited that you're joining us. However you have chosen to worship with us today, we're just glad that you're here in the presence of God, whether you're in this room or at home in your living room, God is here. Amen. All right. Well, we have off to a great start already this morning. Uh, I just want to let you know that since 2002, God has been using many of you in this room to sponsor children in Haiti. We've got a sister church there in Tibiwan, Haiti, and we have sent a number of children through school down there. If that is something that might interest you, uh, seeing the work that God is doing in that town down in Haiti, then there's a table out in the lobby today. Uh, and if you're interested in your viewing with us online, just post something in the comments and we'll connect with you later. Uh, we would love to continue to uh, do the work that God has called us to do in that village. So, uh, Now, another thing, uh, we've got a prayer gathering after church today. And so if God is uh, stirring in your heart this morning, maybe with that song or maybe with what Kevin has said, then we would invite you to stay after, hang out for a little bit, and we'll have a prayer gathering. Uh, but that's not all. If right now, even in this moment, you would like somebody to pray with you, uh, you can text the word prayer. There's some information right there in front of you. And folks online, there's a link in the comments as well where you can text in. And literally right now, folks are waiting, and they can be praying with you in this moment. Uh, and so let's turn it over to Pastor Kevin and let him take over again. Thank you, Alex. Good morning again, everybody. How you doing? All right. So if you're uh, new to our church, my name is Kevin. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you so much for joining us. Those of you watching online, especially if this is a new experience for you, thank you so much for worshiping with us online today. So glad that you're with us for the service. We're in the middle of a series called 167, Faith for Everyday Life. We're talking in the series about what it means to put our faith into practice in real everyday ways in the other 167 hours of our week outside of this hour where we have the great joy and blessing of being together uh, for this worship service right now. This is great, but what about the rest of our week, right? What does it mean for us to follow Jesus in very real practical ways? And so what our, our, our guide for this series, we've been learning from the book of James. We believe the book of James is probably, possibly the earliest writing uh, in the New Testament. In, in your Bible, it was written by one of Jesus' younger brothers named James, who went on, he went from being a person who was opposed to the ministry of his own brother, uh, to having a miraculous, life-changing experience with the risen Christ, and then going from there to becoming one of the leaders, one of the first kind of pastors, even before that had sort of really existed, of the first gathering of Christ followers, like a church, but don't think church with a building and all of that. No, it was an underground network that was springing up this movement of Jesus in Jerusalem in the first few years uh, after Jesus was born. And so we're continuing today in our series. We're going to study the opening 10 verses from chapter 4. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> Guys, you're going to have to do better than that. They're, they're way outdoing you right now. It's just two of them. Are you ready for this? Yeah. All right, there we go. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Megan's with me. All right, great. So the first 10 verses, chapter 4. Here we go. Let's bring it up on the screen. Great. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you, James says? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? That verse, by the way, is key. We're going to come back to it. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage, what's the next word in the text? War. 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 To take it away from them. Remember, James is talking to Christians, to his fellow Christians right now. Yet, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. Apparently, it's gone so far off the rails already that even their prayers, their pastor is like saying, hey, you guys need to pray better. You want only what will give you pleasure. Then he says, you adulterers. He's using this like the Old Testament does as a metaphor for their spiritual relationship with God. Spiritual infidelity. You spiritual adulterers. Don't you realize that friendship with the world 
makes you an enemy of God. Time out. So if you're just joining us today, we've already covered some of this ground. Remember, we're in chapter 4. So when he says friendship with the world, this is James's like shorthand. This is all the stuff he's railed against for the previous three chapters. And if you remember from the previous weeks, the ground we've already covered. One of the things that is vexing James is that he's watching his fellow Christ followers kind of buy into the lie of the Roman Empire. So the world, the, the, this Roman Empire society that they live within. Jerusalem's under Roman control. And he's watching them uh, basically turn away from the way of Jesus and start kind of mimicking and copying uh, the patterns of the Romans um, all around them uh, in the culture. I read one expert who just put it this way. I thought it was a great way to say it. He said, James's problem here is that his friends are rejecting God's law of love and starting to cozy up to whoever's powerful and especially whoever's wealthy. So maybe that helps give us a kind of a, a richer understanding there of when he, when he says making friends with the world. This is specifically what he has in mind. And by doing that, it makes you an enemy of God. And we'll keep going. I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. So right there, James is telling us it should be faithful to God. There's this spirit that God has put in you and put in me. And this spirit within us longs for wholeness, yearns to be in a place of, of rightness. And James is saying, each of us have to make a, a choice, a decision. How are, we, we can't, the, the, the fact that this thing within us is yearning for something, that's already there. That's like put in from the, you know, that's your factory default settings. But then you and I have to make a choice of how we're going to harness and direct that energy uh, within us. And so James is talking to his friends and he's, he's pointing out to them that some of them, unfortunately, are, are using this yearning within them to go after the wrong things. That they're pursuing things other than deep intimacy with God. Later, St. Augustine would say it this way. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. All right, back to the scripture. And God gives grace generously. God gives grace generously. So the first part of this is James just like beating us up. I mean, taking us to the woodshed and just going after us. <laughs> but remember, James is saying these words out of gentleness and out of love. And this pivot right here, God gives grace generously. Some of your Bible translations might say that verse this way. It might say, God gives even more grace. Even more grace. What good news. What hope, right? For those of us, as we kind of go through the message today, if you find yourself identifying with some of these uh, uh, things that James is pointing out that need to be corrected uh, within us, James also gives us the remedy. He says that, guess what, guys? God gives us grace. He gives us another chance to get this right. As the scriptures say, and then here James is quoting from Proverbs chapter 3, God opposes the proud, and here comes, here comes again, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. See, now James is telling us what to do. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. If you were here a couple weeks ago, this is when we looked at that word double-minded. James loves to kind of say it that way. Some of us are double-minded. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. These are all, this is all language of repentance. Let there be sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. Read the last line out loud with me. Go. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. Okay. I know what you're already thinking. There is a lot going on in these 10 verses. We cannot possibly unpack all of that uh, today. So instead, what I want to do is I want us to zero in on what I think could be a key to helping us start to go uh, beneath the surface in these very deep and rich 10 verses. And, and the key is that very first opening question. It's verse one. Let's bring it up on the screen again. It's this part. In fact, would you say it out loud with me? Go. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? 
quarrels and fights. That's what James is, that's, that's, that's what's got him all worked up. Quarrels and fights. So to understand that, it helps to, to remember kind of some of the history that, that I've already taught about going on in first century Jerusalem. The society, the culture, is just torn apart by a political strife and tensions and divisions that are very, very extreme. The cause of all of their division, of course, was not a pandemic. It was outright persecution. See, there are these differing views rising up about what to do. There were groups that wanted to violently, they're called the zealots. They wanted to violently overthrow the Roman occupation. They wanted to take up arms and go after them to make things right for how horribly they had treated the Jewish people. But then there were other groups who felt like that was a hopeless cause and they wanted to pursue different solutions. And what happened with this debate was it got out of control uh, to the point of literally physical violence. In fact, some of the language James uses indicates that potentially even, even people were killing, literally killing, not just metaphorically, literally killing each other because they were so uh, heated and divided that even families were torn apart. Uh, within, within family units, there would be different perspectives on what to do here. This had all spilled over into this new church that James is leading, and James is saying, enough. So Kevin's translation of what you see on the screen right now, what was up there, verse 1? What's causing all of this ruckus? <laughs> enough. This is the Bible's way of saying what my poor mother said the day when my little brother and me were I. I ended up hurling him uh, over the living room couch. It pulled his arm out of his shoulder socket. We ended up in the emergency room, and my poor mother's saying, enough, enough. And Keith deserved it, by the way. He was to blame. <laughs> I'm your pastor. You have to trust me on this. <laughs> this is James saying, just like my mom and maybe your mom had to as well, enough. Enough with the fighting and the quarreling. Can't we all just get along? But notice the amazing wisdom. Oh, it's on the screen. You can see it. In just one sentence. See, James doesn't waste time trying to settle the disputes, trying to, trying to point out what's the right argument and the wrong argument here. No, James is going straight to the source, to the root. He's going after the reason why they have so much conflict to begin with, not just trying to settle the score between two different opinions or perspectives. No, he's going straight to the root. Why is everyone so argumentative with each other to begin with? See, long before there's a battle out there, there's a battle in here. It's true for me. It's true for you, too. It's true for James and everyone in his church. You can see it on the screen. Why are there all these quarrels and fights out there? He's talking about what's going on here. So one of James's contemporaries, Paul, uh, wrote several books in the New Testament. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. He described it in Paul's language as fightings without and fears within. This link between what's going on internally and externally. This is key to us having a deeper understanding. If you haven't already gotten there yet, I'll just spoil the ending for us. I'm talking today about conflicts, about quarrels and conflicts and arguments. And so maybe for some of you, you're in the middle of one of those right now, just kind of caught up in the heat of battle with someone else or some other people. Or maybe for you, things are calm right now, but I can tell you this because uh, I just know the world we live in, and I see your prayer requests. It's going to be coming your way again <laughs> at some point. You're going to find yourself in one of those kind of conflicts and very heated battles again. So today's message, it really is for all of us. And thanks be to God. See, when Paul says there's fightings without but fears within, that there's a perfect love, this perfect love of Jesus, that the Bible tells us has the power to cast out all fear all fear within us, which of course then can free us. It can free us from all the pointless fighting and quarreling that's going on without. We don't have to make friends with that Roman Empire way of domination and control where I have to win every argument or I have to crush or dehumanize anyone who gets in my way. I don't have to make friends with that. No, instead James says we can become friends with God. 
friends with God. Jesus said that too. We can become friends with God, the one who gives you and I a peace within ourselves that the Bible says goes beyond all human understanding. So even when I find myself in the heat of battle, the peace is that perfect and it's that mysterious that even when the world would tell me that, that Kevin, you've got to win at all costs, that you need to obsess over this conflict or this argument, see, when I make friends with God, James says there's actually a better way for us to live. But man, the lure of the world's way, it is so strong, so strong, in fact, that it infected Jesus' own 12 disciples after they had been spending all their time hanging out with them, sitting around the campfires, making s'mores together, feeding the people and healing the people. And it was just amazing. It was kumbaya every day, but not really. Because look with me at this, what happens in Mark chapter 10. Because one day in the middle of all of this loveliness, you know what Jesus' disciples do? They start bickering over who is the greatest disciple. I'm the best. You're not the best. You're second best. I'm the best. They all start fighting with each other, literally on the road as they're walking. Can you imagine how frustrated Jesus got? Well, he's Jesus, so he kept it under control, but I would have completely lost my mind, right? Have you heard anything I've said or seen anything I've done for the past two years? Jesus' own disciples, they all start fighting with each other over who's the best. You know, just like the people that James is writing these words to that we're studying today, I wonder if James was remembering The words of Jesus in this moment from Mark chapter 10, when James write his words, because here's how the story plays out. Jesus, of course, overhears that his disciples are fighting with each other about who's, who's the greatest. Jesus knows that his disciples have allowed their own internal insecurities to just poison their hearts with envy and jealousy, doing their own version of, you know, the Instagram ranking contest within their, their group of 12. And so Jesus uses this moment to sit them down and have a little chat. (laughs) And here's what he says to them. I'm going to read verse 43, verse 44. He looks at his disciples and he says, not so with you. Jesus talks about the world's way of playing that game. Jesus looks at them and says, not so with you. Not with my followers. It's going to be different. And Jesus goes on to say this. Whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. All right, back to James' words in chapter 4. Because I really wonder if James is hearing echoes of Jesus' words from that moment. I'm sure that became a very favorite and famous story among Jesus' disciples and the early early Christians. How it would be different among them than it is with people in the world. Because James, he loves the people he's writing to all their quarrels and fights. James loves his fighting friends, loves them so much that he wants to set them free from the bitterness of just endless ping pong back and forth conflict that just goes on and on with no way out. And so James points them back to the way of Jesus, which is where you and I can find healing for our hurting souls, where we can be made whole if we're willing to humble ourselves before God and others. Remember Jesus' lesson on that day on the road when they were fighting over who's the best. He says, not so with you, but whoever wants to be great, then great. Make yourself a servant. (laughs) Whoever wants to be first, then great. Make yourself a slave of all. These are words of humility. And in that passage that that we're looking at from chapter four, you know three times in that passage, James teaches us to be humble. In the first century, in the 21st century, Our culture teaches us to go into conflict armed for battle, but Jesus still says, not so with you. There is a better way. Look with me at the screen, because in conflict, in conflict, you and I wage peace armed with humility. Would you say that line out loud with me? Go. In conflict, I wage peace armed with humility. We don't have to wage war. We're actually commanded to be different, to wage peace. So so the next time that I'm tempted to pick up a sword, (laughs) and unlike in the first century, when I go into battle with someone, I'm not actually like, like literally fighting someone with a sword. For me in my life, the way it plays out more is with verbal attacks and parries. (laughs) Know what I'm saying? Is the next time I'm tempted to pick up my sword and shred somebody with some verbal attack, Instead, James would tell me, put down my sword and pick up what? A servant's towel. (laughs) 
We have a choice to wage war or we can choose to pick up a different weapon and wage peace, armed with humility. All right, so look with me at verses six and seven. When we were going through this, remember I said James gives us, he gives us a plan. He gives us a, a new plan of attack once we make the decision not to wage war, but to wage peace. He shows us three things, three simple steps. Maybe this, maybe one or even all three of these will be something God wants you to hear today. I hope that that's the case. So look with me at the first one, and would you say the highlighted uh, phrase out loud, go. So humble yourselves before God. If we want to wage peace armed with humility, if we want to follow the way of Jesus, if we want to find some freedom from all of the quarrels and the fighting, if we want to make friends with God and not friends with the way of the world, it starts here by humbling ourselves before God. If I want to reduce the amount of conflict in my life, James says, that's great, Kevin. The journey begins when you are willing to become humble before God. Now, humble, of course, if you're new to the Bible's perspective on that term, it does not mean making uh, ourselves a doormat. A better way to think of it is it, it means making ourselves down to earth, down to earth, grounded, dependent on God's grace and provision in my life, humble enough to let go of my ego and also to be cleansed of my envy humble enough to put away the sword because <laughs> it takes humility to change out this weapon for this one. Grounded enough, secure enough, humble enough to choose to wage peace, to pick up the servant's towel. Look with me at a verse from one of the oldest books in the Hebrew Bible. It takes us all the way back to the book of Job. Look with me at chapter 5, verse 11. It says, the lowly he sets on, what's the next word? High. Those who mourn are lifted to safety. See, the world that you and I live in, it's not that different from James's world. Still to this day, in various sneaky ways, it teaches me and you that we have to be the top dog, that we have to be number one, that we have to win at all costs. I mean, we come by this honestly. I just finished assistant coaching in a youth soccer league where they don't keep score, and yet every single game Every single kid on my team knew precisely and exactly what the score was between the two teams. <laughs> we live in this world where we want to win at all costs, but guess what? God reverses things, and thanks be to God that he sets us free. It's the great reversal. You see it on the screen, or you did, the lowly. He sets on high from one of the very oldest books of wisdom in the Hebrew Bible. Those who are down in mourning, he lifts them up to the high place. See, when we stoop down to serve others, remember that story about Jesus washing his disciples' feet? When we stoop down to serve others, which, by the way, is also the same posture when we stoop down to kneel in prayer. Amen. Yeah. God lifts us up in his power, doesn't he? Mikey, it's the great reversal. Friends, the lowly. He sets on high. It starts with us, though, being willing to go low. His strength is made perfect. Listen to me, fellow Americans. His strength is made perfect not in our winning, but in our weakness. Scripture says <laughs> his strength is perfect in our weakness when we choose to wage peace instead of waging war. It's this ancient wisdom that Jesus was channeling and putting into his own words when he told a story, it's one of my favorite stories. It's a parable. You'll find it in your Bible in Luke chapter 18. Listen to this timeless wisdom of Jesus. So Jesus told a story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness. Ugh. Don't, you, don't self-righteous folks just drive you crazy? <laughs> Me too. You know the problem, though? I, I struggle with that. I've told you before, I'm a recovering Pharisee, a recovering legalist. So this story for me hits a little too close to home. Maybe for you too. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other, though, was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. Okay, let's pray this together, the Pharisee's prayer, but you got to do it in like a very self-righteous voice. Ready? All right, here we go. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. Shame on you for praying like that. Come on. 
But the tax collector stood at a distance. He dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, and let's do it again. Would you pray the tax collector's prayer with me out loud? Go. Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Yeah. Do you notice how short that prayer is, by the way? One sentence, one breath. And look what Jesus then says about this. He says, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. And let's finish it out loud together. Here we go, church. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So how do we wage peace armed with humility? We start by humbling ourselves before God. Now we're ready to look at the second one together. Would you say the phrase out loud with me? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. James says, turn from the devil. Resist those evil temptations and those evil desires. And this whole thing is framed in terms of quarreling and fighting with other people. Apparently the devil loves a good conflict. <laughs> I've experienced that before. Maybe you have too. The devil loves to jump in there with a little bit of gossip, a little bit of silent treatment, little bit of personal attack. <laughs> yeah. Resist that. Jesus' way, of course, is greater than the devil, the Bible says. We don't fight fire with fire. Martin Luther King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can. So in the name of Jesus, we need to turn on the lights of mercy. <laughs> the light of forgiveness in our quarrels and in our fights, especially the light of grace. So Pastor Cindy Jones is a dear friend of mine and was a former colleague. We got to serve together for a few years at a church. So Pastor Cindy, uh, she retired after a long ministry uh, in Illinois. She shared with me a story that uh, when she and her husband Mike, when he was living, who was also a pastor, they got to serve together as a clergy couple at the Methodist Home for Children and Youth in Illinois. And while there, Cindy said, she met a teenage boy named Thomas who had extreme anger issues. She said she and the rest of the team had lots and lots of grace and compassion for angry young Thomas because they knew about his uh, just traumatic and horrible upbringing and that he had come by those issues very honestly. They also knew this, that he had landed at the children's home, uh, looked at by others and even a state agency as kind of a hopeless lost cause. <laughs> but because my friend Cindy believed in the way of Jesus, she knew that Jesus actually had power to heal even angry young Thomas from his rage. So one of the team members who was in the woodworking shop, he decided one day to make Thomas a wooden cross. It was the perfect size that he could keep it in his pocket and he could hold it in his hand. So they told him, whenever you get mad and you make those fists, and you just want to start punching things or people. Instead, when that anger kicks in, we want you to squeeze the cross as hard as you can. And let that just remind you that Jesus loves you, even in the midst of your anger. So Thomas held on to that cross for a year. He still got mad a lot. She said they could see it happen as he would walk around. They could see it kick in the red in the face and, and breathing hard. And they could see his hand go down into his pocket. And they could see him grab that cross and clutch it so tightly, in fact, that apparently it, it left an imprint in the skin in his hand. And you know, Jesus made good on his word. Jesus made the devil flee. From young Thomas, slowly but surely, he actually started to relieve Thomas of his anger. Thomas started to get along with his peers. And then even with Pastor Cindy and the rest of the staff, she said years later, as a healed and transformed man, the anger would still kick in. <laughs> and he had learned by then just to trace the imprint of a cross in his hand. How do we wage peace? Armed with humility, we resist the devil. And let Jesus make him flee. And look with me at the last one. Would you say it with me? Go. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. When we go looking for God, friends, here's the good news. We find that God is already looking for us, and he meets us with love. 
even if people are mad at you, are frustrated with you, even when you're in conflict with another person, we find that we can be secured and anchored in God's love for us. You know, this has made all the difference in my life. There are times when I mishandle situations. There are times when I participate in a decision that uh, upsets, disappoints, frustrates folks. There are times when I say something in a conversation in the heat of the moment that I instantly uh, regret. Maybe you can relate with any of that in your own life. Sometimes it plays out personally for me. Sometimes it plays out uh, in my role as your lead pastor. But you know what's made all the difference for me is when folks are just very, very upset or angry at me, with me, in conflict with me, is that God's love for me remains unchanged. It really does change things when we let Jesus free us from needing the approval of that person. You know who that person is in your life or those people. It really changes things when we no longer need certain folks to kind of approve of us or give us an girl or an attaboy, but we can simply rest in God's unchanging love for us, even in the midst of conflict. And it gets even better too. Because I've found this, this has been a harder leap for me to make, but that person who is driving me nuts, guess what? God loves that person too. <laughs> as much as God loves me. And it's true. That person who it's even hard for you to pray for sometimes. God loves that person as ferociously as he loves you and he loves me. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Now all of this was wonderfully new and exciting news for James and those early Christians, because it did not used to work this way. It didn't used to play out where you could just draw close to God and he would draw close to you. There were hoops that had to be jumped through. Things were very limited. Access to God was very, very uh, controlled. Look with me at your favorite book of the Bible, Leviticus, chapter 21. Here are the ancient rules. No descendant of Aaron, these are words to the priests, no descendant of Aaron who has a defect may approach the altar to present special gifts to the Lord. Since he has a defect, he may not approach the altar to offer food to his God. See, the way it used to work was only at the temple, only in certain designated places could you even find the presence of God. But even there, you couldn't draw close to God's presence, not if you were considered spiritually unclean in any way. Everything was mediated and limited and controlled. But then in the fullness of time, see, this is what blew the minds of James and the early followers of Jesus and should still blow our minds today. Jesus shows up and announces this is why he has come, his purpose. This is Mark chapter 1, some of the opening words. He says, the time promised by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins, yes, and believe the good news. It, Jesus is bypassing all of these old systems of animal sacrifices and all the rest and praying certain prayers at certain times. No, Jesus is saying you can repent right now at this moment that Jesus becomes your access to God and my access to God too. God is now making his altar in your heart. God's presence is with us and with you. Maybe that's the whole reason God brought you to church today. It's just to hear once again that the kingdom of God is at hand. It's arrived and it's growing all the time around us, even within us. And on this Pentecost Sunday, when we give God thanks for the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out on us, we live with that confident assurance that God has already drawn so close to us, even the folks over there, even you back there in the left corner, all the way over there that God has drawn so close to us, and to you too, even to Wade, even to you guys up in the booth, God's drawing so close, no. so close to us. Because when we come close to God, we find that God has already gone looking for us. Maybe you're in a conflict today, and it's making you feel disconnected. The, the, that the, the interruption or the tension that has popped up in a relationship or with another person in your life has infected your spiritual life as well. But see, today, James's words are just as powerful as they were when he first wrote them. Come close to God, my friends, and he will come close to you. Not only in the midst of the conflict, you'll find that he actually transforms the conflict itself because it changes everything when we stop waging war and instead we wage peace armed with humility. Fifteen years ago, I watched in amazement as... 
uh, dear friends of mine, Tim and Jennifer uh, Goshorn, they followed a very unexpected and surprising nudge from the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that was poured out at Pentecost, got poured out of them in a very uh, powerful way. And this nudge led them to uh, literally sell the farm. They enjoyed a very comfortable life uh, with their family, their, their children on a farm in northern Kentucky. And they moved to Central America for a year so that they could learn Spanish fluently. So then after that year, they could move to the highlands of rural Peru in South America and become cross-cultural workers among the poorest of the poor. And so for the past decade, they have brought hope to the hopeless by caring for orphans, uh, widows, drug addicts, prisoners. They literally go into the jails and the prisons. Another big part of their ministry is uh, going into orphanages. Uh, any person um, that uh, they feel like is vulnerable or is uh, at risk or on the edges, you see their picture on the screen with two of their children. And so for these past years, the folks you see on the screen have sought to not only uh, share, but also be the good news of Jesus wherever God opens a door for them, uh, wherever he leads them now. Their work is at times quite dangerous. They've shared with me that they live and minister in areas that for decades have been torn apart by political violence and crime. In some ways, it reminds me of some of the context that uh, James was writing in, first century uh, Jerusalem. And yet they keep asking for God's protection, and they keep going back. Now, this past year, things have become uh, very bad because of what COVID uh, and the economic shutdowns have done to the economy um, in Peru. Uh, it unfortunately, tragically, is one of the third world developing nations uh, that has just been absolutely devastated, especially the folks who are the poorest of the poor uh, by COVID. And yet, Tim and Jennifer um, declined an opportunity to come back to the U.S. and said, decided they would just go on waging peace in Jesus' name armed with humility wherever they go. So not long ago, God led them into the life of a very precious single mom whose life has been upended by conflict after conflict, just all kinds of chaos. She's raising her eight-year-old son who was born deaf, but the mom can't afford to pay for him uh, to receive treatment, medical treatment that he needs. But all of that changed recently because a donor, uh, someone else in the body of Christ who felt a nudge uh, from the Holy Spirit to do something, sent a financial gift through Tim and Jennifer to cover all of the costs for the mom and her boy to be transported to the Children's Hospital in Lima, the capital city, and receive hearing implants that will enable this boy to hear for the very first time in his life. And a few days ago, Tim uh, sent me an iPhone video of uh, him and Jennifer delivering this good news to the mom. Watch this. <laughs> So, mucho tiempo. It's a grand bendición. Sí. This is what it looks like when God's kingdom draws near in the midst of conflict. In chaos. This is what it looks like when followers of Jesus wage peace, armed with humility. You know, we can do this too in our daily lives starting now. If we will humble ourselves before God when the world is telling us to win, instead if we'll resist that temptation from the devil to go fighting with others, and if instead we'll go looking for God and discover that God is already looking for us. Do you have a conflict today that you need to bring to the cross of Jesus so that God can set you free from all the fighting and the quarreling so that he can give you new life? Would you stand and pray with me?
So we say, just like the followers of Jesus have for centuries, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Fall fresh on us today. Jesus, we thank you that you've come looking for us armed with your perfect peace. That you've come to us in the form of a servant. That you've made yourself in your own words a slave of all. To show us the way to freedom. To show us the way to full and eternal life that begins now. We thank you for this gift of um, unlimited, unbridled access to God that you've given us. And so we claim that today, even now as we pray together. God, we seek you. Lord, we draw close to you today in our own ways. We draw close to you now. We know you're drawing close to us, but would you help us become more aware of that? Would you open our eyes to see what you want us to see? And if we have a place in our life that is conflicted, is chaotic in some way, Jesus, would you give us some fresh wisdom now? If we've picked up a sword without realizing it, would you take it? Would you maybe, just in your gentleness, would you... Would you wrest that weapon out of our hand and replace it with a servant's towel? That we might wage peace wherever you send us. And so as we sing this last song together, Lord, we seek today a new and powerful experience of your Holy Spirit at live, alive within us and in our midst. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing another, uh, we're going to sing a closing song together. And then after that song, like Alex shared before, uh, we're going to take a few minutes after the service to reset. And then we're going to gather in here for about 30 minutes. Um, we've got some stuff planned to have uh, just a wonderful time of prayer together. And this, of course, is for all of us, but especially. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity for any of you who have some sort of need, specific need. Um, maybe it's related to some sort of healing in your life, a physical healing, spiritual, mental, relational. Um, we're going to have time for us to bring all of that to God uh, together. So I want to invite you after the service, if you can stick around for 30 minutes, I promise that, uh, that you'll be blessed. And after our worship service ends here in a moment, I want you to know too that Pastor George and our prayer team are available to you. So maybe if you're not able to stay for our prayer gathering after the service, but you still want someone to be able to pray with you, um, they'll be available to you right at the doors uh, as you leave. Let's sing together. Sweetie.
It's been great to worship uh, together today. As uh, we get ready to go, if you have a gift that you would like to give, a financial gift to partner with the work that God is doing through Crossroad Church, you can do that anytime online at our website, which is crossroad.church. If you have an in-person gift uh, that you would like to give, we have giving boxes that you'll see by the exits as you leave. Thank you so much for your generosity uh, and, and for your support. Um, we will start with our, our prayer gathering um, at 1120, uh, so in about 10 minutes. And now before you go, would you receive this blessing? My brothers and sisters in Christ, may you go out into this world filled with so many fightings without and fears within so many people's hearts. May you go out as a follower of Jesus, emboldened and empowered by his Holy Spirit poured into you to wage not war, but to wage peace, arming yourself with humility. May you humble yourself before God wherever you go. May you resist all of the devil's temptations. And may you come close to God, knowing that he's already come close to you. Amen.